today's Agadicity TV episode, we will try something new. Rory Sutherland will speak to us, and he will not speak about anything formal or mathematical, but he will speak to us about how the general thinking, the concepts surrounding the ergodicity question, are informing his thinking about problems in his daily business practice. Rory is vice chairman of the creative advertising agency Ogilvy. And he recorded this talk for our annual conference, Agadicity Economics 2022, in this case. As an ad man, Rory's job is to think about how we perceive something, a product or a service, and how our perception could be different, perhaps. Without misrepresenting what's there, the question is often, is there a different perspective we could take that would allow us to see another aspect of what's there? The agadicity problem in its full breadth is important precisely because of that. We're used to thinking along one track laid down in the early days of probabilistic thinking in the 1650s, really. The assumption of agadicity implicit in this early thinking is that we can understand the individual by studying the aggregate, that what happens on average to many is what happens typically to one. Of course, we know that this assumption often fails and recognizing that failure opens up an unusually fruitful new perspective, which allows us to perceive what is in a radically different, often more compassionate and creative way. But enough from me, here is Rory. Now, it's a perfectly reasonable question for any of you to ask, which is why the hell is a guy from an advertising agency and someone principally with an interest in behavioral science so absolutely fascinated by the concept of ergodicity? And I've got several answers to this. The simplest one is that as someone who's studied behavioural science and behavioural economics, I've never been entirely comfortable referring to loss aversion as a bias. It seems perfectly sensible to me, for all kinds of reasons, why people should wish to take decisions which reduce the variance of an outcome. And I would argue slightly self-servingly that one of the reasons I think people have a strong preference for buying famous brands is not actually because they think those brands are better. It's because they think those brands are actually more reliably going to be OK. There's a colleague of mine now in his, I think, late 80s, who made this point to the famous David Ogilvy back in the 1970s. He said, I don't think people buy brands because they think they're better. I think they buy brands because they're more certain that they're good. And my own expression of this, which was quoted in one of Nassim Taleb's books, is that people don't go to McDonald's because it's brilliant. McDonald's isn't a brilliant restaurant, except in one respect. It's absolutely brilliant at not being terrible. OK, you won't have the best meal you've ever had in your life. I wouldn't recommend you take someone to McDonald's on a date. That's what Nando's is for, after all. But... If you absolutely certainly want to have food where the pricing is reasonable, your kids will eat it, it tastes pretty good, it's exactly as you expected, where the toilets are clean and you won't end up with the shits, McDonald's is bang on the money. And so I've always believed strongly that there's a strong instinct for variance reduction in human behaviour. Now anybody with any experience of life realises that many, many of the decisions we take cast a shadow into the future that three catastrophes early in your life mean that it's very, very difficult to get back up from the floor, that these things are not actually independent. And so ergodicity helped me understand something that I'd always instinctively believed but never been able to justify. And I think that's important, and it's important for a simple reason. There's another lesson from behavioural economics. As I mentioned, I don't think loss aversion is necessarily a bias. I also don't think, by the way, and if anybody wants to show me the maths to prove I'm right, I'd be ecstatic. I also don't think that sunk cost bias is necessarily a bias. And so I was always uncomfortable with people effectively waltzing in and on the basis of fairly shallow mathematics, suggesting that human instinct that had been, after all, honed by, you know, many million year, millions of years of evolution, that human instinct on risk was somehow getting it wrong and the mathematicians were the first people, the economists were the first people to point this out. I was never really very comfortable with this. But the other thing I think that's useful from behavioural economics about ergodicity is that effectively, and this is what fascinates me, 
There's a great phrase someone used to describe human perception. And the phrase was, we don't really understand what we see. We see what we can understand. And I think there are extraordinary cases where in a world increasingly dominated by data, we're going to get the data wrong. And we're going to get the data wrong because our concept of averaging is wrong. The dynamics we understand for probability are effectively the idea of additive one-shot games where each decision has no impact on the future decisions you can make. In other words, what you try and do is you try and split decisions into watertight compartments <coughs> where the consequences of one decision do not cast a shadow onto what you can do in the future. And I think this will, if economics continues to maintain this pretense, it will not only be very rude about advertising because it won't understand what people are trying to do, which is, after all, in the scheme of things, a fairly minor problem. It will start formulating policies which are downright hopelessly wrong. And there are lots and lots of things we can now understand, I think, about human behaviour, which economics doesn't really make sense of. For one of the things it would be poorer people tend to eat unhealthily because they can't afford to make a mistake. If you have young children, I was working on this as a project with a large food company, if you have young children and you're rich, you can try them on spinach, and you can try them on spinach in five different ways until you discover they quite like it steamed or garlic or chilli or whatever it is. Okay? If you're poor, you can't afford to that degree of experimentation. One investor friend of mine describes ergodicity as follows. He said, People always say you need to speculate to accumulate. He said that's completely wrong. You need to accumulate in order to speculate. And I think if we don't have a better understanding of um, life as it is seen through the eyes of people travelling over time and instead use this entirely bogus and unrepresentative averaging concept to try and understand people at scale, large parts of policy will go hopelessly wrong. More important, really interesting ideas won't be understood or will be unthinkingly rejected. So here's an idea I'll share with all of you, which might interest you a bit. Roger L. Martin, Canadian business guru, former dean of the Rotman Business School at the University of Toronto, proposed to, I think, the Conservative Party of Canada, something which nearly got accepted, which is an ergodicity economics approach to taxation. Now, as you all know, in the UK and in most countries, there were exceptions back in the 80s in the United States, you're taxed on your income one year at a time and every year you get a certain amount of income tax free. Roger L. Martin simply said this is actually stupid. It should work across your life. The tax exemption should not be one year at a time. It should be a lifetime thing. So that as he proposed, I think, the first 200 and something thousand Canadian dollars you earned in your lifetime were untaxed after which you were taxed on everything. Now think about it, that is an extraordinarily ingenious idea which actually recognises the fact that at the beginning of your life you need to accumulate capital and buy things at a much greater rate than you do when you're older. But it's an idea that economists on their own I don't think would necessarily come up with. I think it's an idea that fundamentally understands that what matters to people is how they live and prosper and flourish through time Whereas what matters to naive statisticians is what the figures look like in aggregate. And the aggregate loses touch with the individual experience. Now that brings me to my second point about why I find this so interesting as an advertising guy. Because the fundamental fight we have to fight as marketers, as advertisers, as people who are looking at to improve customer experience, is that the kind of things that customers care about through time are not well captured when you aggregate figures. I'll give you a very simple example of this. I've been arguing for a long time that companies should invest much, much more highly uh, in uh, dealing with customer complaints. And the interesting thing is that you can have a number of dissatisfied customers and look at an aggregate, it doesn't look that bad. What you've got to realise from the lens of individual lived experience is this, is you've ordered something online. The product hasn't arrived. You've just had a bad experience with that company. Then you go online to try and confirm the thing and they won't give you a telephone number to call. 
Eventually, you find the telephone number and nobody answers it. Okay. What you've now experienced is three bad experiences in a row, which is likely to lose your that company your business for the entire life. Now, individually, each of those experiences might just be one of a small percentage of bad experiences. What matters is that they happen in quick succession. And that's the kind of example where aggregate information is a very bad way of understanding lived experience. And I think um, there's something really interesting going on there. There's a great book, which I'm going to recommend you all read as the companion volume to the Ergonist, the economic conference. The author's still alive. I don't know if he knows anything about ergodicity. It'd be interesting to find out. But what the book is called, it's called Seeing Like a State. It's by a guy called, I think it's James C. Scott, who is an anarchist anthropologist. And the subtitle of the book is Why So Many Grand Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Fail. And his argument is that the world is understood by people at the top through a lens of crude averaging and aggregation. And as a result, the view that's adopted by the people at the top, whether it's in government or a business or a company or any organisation, tends to be completely misaligned with the experience of the individual on the ground. That the need, if you like, for legibility, as Scott calls it, interferes with true human empathy and understanding. In other words, they come to clash. And this is what brings me back to that point about we don't actually understand what we see, we see what we understand. And the way that information is presented to us and the way in which we might choose to actually frame that information effectively doesn't just bias our comprehension, it actually defines and constrains our comprehension. And in a world of more and more data, bad statistical appreciation terrifies the life out. It really does. And so understanding how an experience feels to someone passing through time, where every decision and every event casts a shadow on how you interpret and respond to future events, strikes me as an essential tool to using data in any form to understand, if you want me to get fancy, the human condition. Okay? And now, but here's where it gets a bit more interesting. OK, because I recommend that book very highly and I, I'm intrigued by ergodicity because it seems to be a better way to understand how people emotionally respond and behave than any of the forms that economics chooses with its idea of expected utility theory. But there's another completely separate reason why I get excited by this whole concept. And that's also related, I think, peripherally to the fact that I work in advertising. And it's this, that it's actually a vehicle for creative ideas. Generally speaking, what creativity means, I think the same can be said of humour, by the way, creativity tends to come about when lots of people see the same thing, but one person sees it, interprets it, processes it in a different way. I'll give you a lovely story of that, OK, of how you can actually change the value of something. It's a perfect example of what I call in my book alchemy, you can change the value of something by simply representing it. Okay, In the early days of Italian espresso machines, they were deeply bothered by the fact that whenever you produced coffee by passing hot water at high pressure through very dark roast fine ground beans, it produced a scum on the top of the coffee. And generally people would either apologise for it, they'd use a spoon to scoop it off. Everybody was terribly upset with this because the idea of an espresso was that it should be pure and black. Until some genius had the idea of calling it crema. Suddenly this is the cream, it's no longer actually an unwanted byproduct, it is actually an enhancement to the coffee itself. Change the way you look at something, you change what something means. When you change what something means, you change someone's emotional response to it. When you change someone's emotional response, you change their behaviour and their thinking. Okay. If you want a beautiful mathematical example, James, or scientific example rather, James Watt invented the horsepower because he realised that the principal market for steam engines was actually mines which were drained by the use of horses. And he realised there was no point in talking to mine owners about cubic capacity or thermal properties or any of the other science of steam engines. The only thing they wanted to know is how many horses can I get rid of if I buy one of these engines? 
And so Watt invented the horsepower as a unit of steam engine power precisely to sell steam engines to, um, uh, to mine owners. Proof of the fact that a lot of great inventors, Edison, Elon Musk, if you can tolerate him or not, they're great hucksters as well as being great inventors. In order to get something new accepted, you, you need to change the minds of people. It's not enough to change reality. People are too attached to the status quo. You actually have to change the way someone looks at something, the way someone appreciates something. And that, in many ways, is a kind of creative act. But I genuinely think that a, a different way of looking at something not only has explanatory power, I think it always has creative power. Because it suddenly enables you to see something which you wouldn't have seen before or to think of something in a way you wouldn't have thought of before. And it occurs to me that when you look at a problem through the lens of ergodicity, suddenly, I think, brands make a lot more sense. Brand preference makes a lot more sense. You buy the Samsung television over the unbranded television, not because you necessarily think it's better probabilistically, but because you think it's less likely to be crap. Once you understand that, you also understand, and this is really important, I think, for any evolutionary scientists, you understand that the bar for human cooperation can actually be set quite a bit lower, and animal cooperation, for that matter. Great thing by, uh, if you ever get a Bromley, go to Crescent Road, where there's the former home of uh, Peter Kropotkin. And perhaps unexpectedly, I'm always a bit of a fan of anarchists. They seem to be the only people other than conservatives who acknowledge the fact that you can't get things right the first time. OK? But, um, uh, you know, uh, cooperation is also a factor in human nature. And I think the standard mode of looking at what you might call things like the free rider problem has been made too difficult mathematically. The gains to cooperation have been made too difficult because of the use of additive dynamics rather than multiplicative dynamics. The understanding that if you improve the average of something, it doesn't say anything for the individual experience. So the understanding that actually experience and perception happens at the individual level and therefore your job is to improve that rather than improving things at the average level, suddenly enable you to look at things in a completely new way. And one of my strange uh, assertions, which I've made a, as a result of this, is to say high speed two is probably not as good an idea as high speed one. Because regardless of what we think, OK, high speed one saves a small number of people a hell of a lot of time every year because it's used as a commuter railway. High Speed 2, since most people don't commute between Manchester and London, High Speed 2 saves a lot of people a bit of time a few times a year. Now, to any standard model, those two are identical. You know, time saved doesn't matter whether you're saving a few people a lot of time or a lot of people a little time. And in terms of the economic case for that railway, there is no distinction made. But it's perfectly obvious these things are totally different. In one case, it's life transforming. Someone in Canterbury can now get a job in, in London, for example. In the other case, unless you're one of the tiny number of people who actually make that journey weekly or fortnightly, OK, it's an irrelevant convenience. You probably were quite looking forward to the train ride anyway. Is it really necessary to save that much time? And yet, nearly all transport policy is predicated on the assumption that saving 100 people 10 minutes is exactly the same as saving 10 people 100 minutes. Now, that might be true if you're processing goods, OK? If you're processing people who have a memory and an experience and all sorts of interesting forms of perception, it simply isn't a valid assumption. And the number of times people will confidently go in and they will effectively infer a specific from a general, OK, I think is absolutely terrifying. And you realise that nearly all people in positions of power are making decisions on an aggregate level. And that is completely detached from how life is actually experienced over time. And so that's the thing that really excites me about this. It's actually a new way of looking at almost anything without the assumption of aggregation, without the assumption of additive dynamics, without the assumption of commutability, if you like, which suddenly brings to light a completely new way of looking at the world. As a result, 
I don't want people just to think of this as an assault on economics, or important and valuable as that will, may be. I think we need to use ergodicity economics as a creative springboard to a better kind of economics. Ideas like Roger Martin's, where you actually effectively upfront weight people's tax relief, I think there are 10 more where that came from, and I'd really like to hear them.